With this, I will start with the first uh, speaker presenter. Uh, he is Shujat Bin Ali. He serves as Paraxel International India Senior Director, Legal and Risk Management Corporate Secretary, member of India Leadership Team. Has been awarded India's Finest In-House Council by Indian Corporate Council Association, Top 100 General Council in India by Legal 500, and previously worked in uh, pharma, information technology, professional services, and manufacturing. Senior Legal Counsel and Corporate Secretary for International Paper, India. And finally, for nine years, Associate Vice President, Legal and Corporate Secretary for Deloitte, US India. Shuja. Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I know we are between you and the lunch. Uh, however, uh, you know, we always have the hunger uh, for the food at the same time hunger for the knowledge. So I'm assuming that, you know, we are all here for the hunger for the knowledge and the information. Yeah. So uh, we had a very nice session, uh, you know, this morning and, you know, uh, we talked about innovation in litigation uh, in the first session, very nicely covered by Amna and uh, Payal as well. Uh, you know, uh, I would be, you know, covering uh, about uh, a litigation risks uh, for the organizations uh, because of the technology uh, and also the compliance risks as well. So as a general counsel, I work with the stakeholders like law firms, uh, the government, uh, the business partners as well, uh, and also uh, the in-house teams as well. So uh, I'll share a few thoughts, uh, you know, in terms of my observations uh, around these areas and how, uh, you know, the technology is actually helping us or creating problem. Uh, let me ask a quick question. How many of us here like the digital age here? Right? We don't have any option. Do you think so? We don't. So I was just uh, thinking, I mean, uh, before I come over here, uh, including me have a conversation uh, with the organizers here, uh, even the booking the tickets or everything. I mean, I don't realize I spoke to anyone. It was all digital. So if you can think, uh, the way we are living in as a consumers uh, in a complete digital world, uh, all the organizations uh, have no choice but to be part of the digital age. So, of course, uh, you know, when we talk about digital age, I mean, it's all about internet and, you know, it's all about commerce, right? I was just curious and I'm uh, very keen to hear some buzzwords. Uh, these days is the word of the buzzwords, right? I mean, can I hear some buzzwords what you keep hearing, uh, you know, in terms of uh, technology or uh, in terms of legal profession, how it is impacting? I mean, can I have a quick buzzwords? Oh, big data. Yeah, this is the word, uh, you know, which we keep seeing in uh, newspapers all the day. Beautiful. Yasmin, thank you. Uh, any other words from that side? Oh, blockchain. Uh, you're actually hogging the limelight. Blockchain, of course. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, you're telling something uh, from the back. I'm just trying to see that you know you're not hungry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I heard. Um, maybe I heard from myself. Internet of Things, right? So I, I was just uh, you know trying to uh, see uh, what are the some of the technology things which is firstly impacting the business. I mean, I mean these days whenever I speak to uh, my business uh, leaders, I mean all they talk about how is artificial intelligence going to impact the business? How is cloud computing going to make the impact to the business? How is 5G services and the broadband that is going to make an impact? You talked about blockchain and cryptocurrencies and how it is that is going to make an impact. And uh, uh, that is one aspect and you know more so uh, the Internet of Things is also uh, which we are talking about and uh, the analytics and the robotics. I mean these are some of the things which uh, are making an uh, you know, impact. And now coming back uh, to the business, I mean we all talked about e-commerce and gone are the days of e-commerce, now we have m-commerce. And more so, businesses are getting global. I mean, these days, I mean, the oh, world is becoming a small place with the cross-border transactions and cross-border businesses uh, going around. And add to that, uh, you know, we have the whole cyber world and the cyberspace as well. And if you see all these things together, uh, last year we have seen several issues around cyber security, cyber attacks going on and you know a lot of issues around. So I mean all these things together, I mean if I were to ask you, uh, you know, would it have an impact on the litigation? Yes or no? Yes, right? 
uh, is it good thing for us or a bad thing for us sorry yeah I, what do you think I, I would say it's good thing for us because i mean at the end of the day I mean, we as a lawyers uh, you know uh, are known for uh, problem solving the more the problems i mean the we will solve the problems so you know on that note uh, i will uh, share uh, my thoughts in two to three buckets you know one is how these uh, aspects are actually uh, you know creating a litigation risk i mean to my mind whatever things which we just discussed today whether it is artificial intelligence or a blockchain or cyberspace or you know digital age and you know we don't have an option at this point of a time to be out of it we just need to move forward and uh, for sure uh, whether irrespective of any industry i mean uh, this is industry agnostic i mean whether it is healthcare or pharma or any other industry we will have a uh, Uh, these risk we will definitely have a litigation risk coming around these areas and uh, uh, i foresee uh, and lot of surveys have specifically mentioned that uh, all these uh, technology uh, areas are definitely are the ones which will create more litigation right i mean we talked about uh, in the first session as to how technology can be used by the courts uh, in terms of managing the litigation i think that was beautifully covered but the point is we all need to be aware that you know how the technology or how the digital age or the cyber world will create a more litigation for us right and again uh, in a different dimensions uh, for example the country which i come from i mean we have a cyber law right uh, we have a privacy law uh, not to a full extent but still an evolving i am sure uh, the same case might be applicable in uh, several of jurisdiction that we don't have a strong cyber law we don't have uh, a strong privacy law of course in some jurisdiction it has uh, we are dealing with an issues of data protection right when it comes to the uh, you know uh, international conventions that's a big area as well so all in all uh, uh, there is no doubt uh, in terms to say that i mean uh, these issues will create a lot of uh you know litigations and new ways of litigation for us so in terms of that i think the you know the thought process the approach uh, of uh, the legal profession whether it is general counsel or uh, it is a law firms i i think uh, it needs a complete different dimension uh, in my humble view and um, coming to a subset of uh, uh, the uh, litigation risk i mean before it get into litigation risk uh more importantly uh because the business is complex because we have uh, complex regulatory laws across jurisdiction and we talked about global businesses being operating in multiple countries uh today compliance risk is also a, a huge aspect i mean uh if you talk about corporate governance the boards want a strong solution all they ask the general counsel is i mean my uh, you know ceo asks me a simple question whenever i meet he simply says okay am i safe <laughs> i mean uh, i am protected right so just ensure that i don't go to uh, prison so i mean he just seeks a single line comfort saying that oh we are all, all, all across the world uh, i hope you're all complying he just asks that i, I hope you're all complying and you know we're not we, we are out of i'm out of trouble right and similarly when i attend as a you know corporate secretary in the board meetings that is the kind of a comfort which uh, the board or the management is looking towards uh, the general counsels and imagine uh, you know my plight uh, as to you know give that kind of a comfort how do can i do that i mean when we are so complex uh, regulations and all across jurisdiction i mean technology is the only way right and uh, thankfully uh, we have lot of technology tools uh, which is helping uh, to give that kind of a comfort in terms of a compliance management a system because i mean manual process is very challenging i mean unless and until there is a robust technology there is a proper workflow uh, i think it's really difficult in the current uh, you know generation uh, for the legal departments uh, to give that kind of a comfort to the boards i mean earlier we had human uh, resources or finance teams i mean they were doing manual accounting and all but i think gone are those days i think similar challenge is coming towards the legal departments uh, to use technology whether it is in terms of a compliance or it is in terms of a contracts management and uh, you know risk arising out of the contracts or litigation management companies having huge litigation uh, right how do they manage the litigation i mean all uh, these things uh, and more so i think we had in a previous session uh, yasmin and modaj talked about ethics and compliance conflict of interest uh, related things again uh, we have all of technology tools 
and i think thankfully uh, at least from a in house standpoint i can say that there are quite a few uh, you know good players in the market who are offering all these solutions which will help uh, an in house counsel to give that kind of a comfort to the stakeholders from a compliance and a risk standpoint uh, moving to the another point i mean which is i think uh, most of the audience are from the law firms and i since i uh, interact uh, with quite a few law firms and i want to share some uh, observations as to how they are uh, you know uh, operating or how they are uh, you know leveraging the technology uh, to manage the litigations uh, you know for the clients so uh, you know one of the things i think we covered about the case management i think that is largely from a uh, you know court standpoint but uh, imagine a law firm uh, you know working for several clients and handling several litigations and if you just imagine if you go probably 10 years back i mean you could just imagine how a law firm would look like with heaps of papers and you know uh, you know lot of books around uh, you know lot of you know bookmarks and i mean you can just imagine but i think current law firms uh, slowly they are uh, you know changing at least uh, the part which i come from and uh, the jurisdictions i work with i mean they are uh, smartly using uh, the uh, collaboration technology uh, they are smartly using the cloud computing uh, which is making collaboration pretty easy document sharing pretty easy uh, information retrieval pretty easy so i think i am seeing uh, a very positive trend of law firms uh, internally using lot of this case management technology and document sharing so that brings a, a very healthy relationship uh, between the in house teams and the law firms in terms of the litigation management uh, another point uh, uh, i have seen uh, you know uh, in terms of uh, you know law firms i think uh, 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 which you mentioned i think uh, as i mentioned about the digital age and the uh, cyber uh, you know age and social media Uh, marshaling the evidence is a big challenge uh, you know and how do uh, the law firms help uh, to you know actually you know collate the evidence and you know do a, a much better job in terms of presenting a strong case and i'm sure again this is a one keyword which i wanted to hear you know i'm i'm sure a lot of uh, you know you heard about e discovery right so several of law firms have uh, you know developed competencies around uh using a discovery uh as a you know important tools and there are uh, some of the law firms have actually partnered with some very good tech companies uh you know to leverage the discovery and so that is a you know one of the key trend uh, uh, i'm hearing about and uh, i'm sure all of you have heard about ibm watson right uh, though there are a lot of news items that <laughs> saying that oh, ibm watson may probably replace some of the lawyers but uh, you know however i mean we can have a debate on that separately but clearly uh, i have seen uh, a lot of uh, you know news around uh, law firms using artificial intelligence or ibm watson uh, uh you know you know very good manner uh, to help their practice at the end of the day uh, law firms want to you know provide better service at a lower cost right uh, so they are uh, you know actually leveraging uh, the technology and uh, uh, yasmin did talked about uh, free updates and all i mean i was just thinking i mean um, how do a law firms manage the relationship with the uh, clients right i mean how do they manage i mean one of the best approach would be the thought leadership or the regular updates and even for that i think uh, there is lot of softwares uh, i know uh, uh, for a matter of fact that uh, uh, one of the law firm i mean uh, we have a colleague here anishit desai and associates they are pretty good uh, in terms of developing thought leadership material or uh, you know doing lot of uh, you know updates around video conference and in fact they have invested uh, on a research and development uh, center uh which is very very important so i mean there are a lot of law firms who are actually investing uh in these technologies one uh, what to think they will think okay oh my god i mean there's a lot of investment right uh, in terms of uh, investing in this technology but if you see uh, the you know returns uh, versus the risk i think you know clearly uh, uh, there are a lot of law firms uh, who are actually investing in uh, various technologies and one were to see uh, the penetration uh, of uh, you know uh, legal technology in litigation uh, with the law firms uh, i uh, since i work for, for a lot of us companies i could see a lot of law firms in us uh, have very nicely adopted uh, probably uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, technology players there being the silicon valley there so there are several of technology players uh, uh, in the uh, you know us and uk who are offering uh, you know very good uh, you know technology products for the law firms and another interesting trend uh, which i would want to share 
uh, is the, some of the law firms who are dealing with intellectual property and uh, high complex uh, litigations are actually leveraging services from uh, the lawyers of the another jurisdictions as well. I mean, they, it all probably started as BPO or knowledge process outsourcing. You know, countries like, you know, India and Philippines uh, for that matter are offering a good uh, legal services uh, you know, sitting right away, uh, you know, from India or Philippines or uh, other countries and being part of the global, uh, you know, law firms uh, supporting, uh, you know, uh, the law firms uh, with the use of the technology because uh, India and other countries are known for the technology uh, building. So technology and at the same time, the legal talent are, uh, you know, providing, uh, you know, uh, low cost, good quality services to some of the law firms. That is also a trend, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, so, so I mean, uh, coming uh, you know to the conclude, I will uh, want to share that. I mean, uh, the age for all of us uh, is to be uh, not only lawyers, but uh, in my view, a techno lawyer. I think that is the need of the day because uh, of the digital age and the f significant impact of the digital age on the business. And as a lawyer, as a you know a business advisor, I need to really understand the business and now the technology as well. These days, any new technology term comes up, I mean, I immediately need to update because I never know what kind of a question, uh, you know, my business would ask. I would immediately need to go and analyze. So, I mean, we need to update uh, ourselves uh, in terms of technology, what's happening and how it is impacting the business and be ready uh, to change, uh, uh, you know, to implement the technology and adopt the technology uh, to provide a better and, uh, you know, efficient services uh, to our clients. I would probably share more thoughts as we move along. Thank you so much. Over to you, Tranquil. Thank you very much for that presentation. Now, uh, the next speaker will be Lady Hilda van der Ten uh, from Prudential Middle East, General Counsel of the IFC, I know, Prince to Project Management, Associate Member of the DIAC, Dubai International Arbitration Center, Mediator for the Supreme Ad Administrative Court of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Member of the Dubai International Financial Center, London Court of International Arbitration. Her strength is general data protection regulation and privacy law. Welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I would like to talk to you about a new law uh, the GDPR, the gen oh, I'm sorry. Can everybody? Yeah, I can hear myself. I would like to talk to you about a new law, the GDPR, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, and that is the new <coughs> I'm sorry, new European Privacy Law. Uh, first question to all of you: If a company from the UAE has no legal presence at all in Europe. Could the GDPR be applicable? Who thinks yes? And who thinks no? Okay. And somebody who thinks depends, or I don't know yet. Okay. Um, and anyone here that has uh, already had GDPR clients in the uh, United Arab Emirates? Not yet. Okay, so we still have a couple of days. Uh, I think it's about 122 days before uh, this new law will be applicable. Um, all of us came here today, of course, to be informed about new developments and to meet colleagues. And I think also because we always need new clients. So I start with a legal perspective. And my goal for today is also to tell you something about the commercial opportunities this new law has to offer. Um, let me start with answering the question how far the tentacles of the GDPR extend. Um, well, it's very clear to all of us, I think, that if a company in the Middle East has a branch or a representative in Europe, that the GDPR is applicable. But did you know that if you are collecting, managing, processing, or sharing, the personal data of EU residents, the GDPR calls them data subjects, that the law is also applicable, even if you have no legal presence in Europe. As soon as you do something with the personal data of an individual in the EU, you could say that it falls within the scope of the GDPR. There's no difference between goods or services. 
So since the UAE, by example, has a lot of experts, several non-EU-based companies will be subject to the regulation and the provisions of this new law. Well, what a question, second question to all of you, what do you think? Is a data subject, so this kind of a natural person, uh, also an EU national residing in the UAE? And is the law applicable if this EU client of yours travels to his country of origin for a holiday? Well, the law states that the regulation applies to the processing of personal data, uh, of data subjects or persons who are in the union. But the law isn't very precise about EU individuals who are resident in the UAE, by example or individuals who are resident in the UAE and in the EU. So, to mention some numbers, um, by example, there are 36 Austrian companies operating directly in the UAE, according to Wikipedia. Uh, we have here 7,000 people from Bulgaria, 6,000 Dutch citizens, I'm one of them, 6,000 Belgians, 10,000 French citizens, 10,000 Germans, 40,000 Brits. The Queen's speech has confirmed that the GDPR will form part of UK law following the Brexit. So we can't say, oh well, these 40,000 people, uh, it doesn't uh, apply to them, it also applies to the Brits. So the first question we should ask ourselves as a legal advisor, or as a company or a government uh, in the UAE is, who are our data subjects in the EU? Uh, if you or your client or a company, by example, like Uber or Karim, <coughs> is processing the personal data of 5,000 data subjects in the EU, and that means the data of 13 persons, also employees, in Europe per day, you or your client has to appoint a data privacy officer. So that's a very nice opportunity for the law firm. Uh, this data privacy or privacy officer doesn't have to work full time for the company, but a natural person has to be appointed. There's no legal limitation on the base location of this data privacy officer. So he can be located outside Europe. For all of us lawyers, I see very interesting legal issues coming up. According to the GDPR, uh, a DPO, so this data privacy officer, you cannot dismiss or penalize for doing the job. So we have this person in the UAE, under the UAE labor law, who is a data protection officer for data subjects in Europe. What would you advise your client when the client is that DPO, that data uh, protection officer, a data privacy officer, or when your client is the company who wants to get rid of this person, what would be your advice? The DPO, the data privacy officer, is independent. So from a business perspective, one of the lawyers of your firm could be the DPO and work via a service contract. But then, of course, we need to make sure that this person's tasks won't conflict with his regular function. On the other side, with the new law, there's a possibility to assign one of your experts on an ongoing basis and with an official title, which is from a commercial view, I think, very interesting. Be aware of the difficulties of working as a DPO. You have to be a trusted advisor and a police officer, kind of, at the same time. In the UAE, there is no requirement under the data protection law for organizations to appoint a data protection officer, although there is a general obligation of a data controller to implement appropriate measures to protect the personal data. The GDPR, this new European privacy law, aims primarily to give back control, uh, to give back the control back to the EU citizens and residents over their personal data, and to simplify the regulatory environment for international businesses. It becomes enforceable from May 25 this year, so we have, I think, 127 days. 
it is directly binding and directly, directly applicable. So let's assume it's your client or one of your prospects that processes the personal data of these 13 persons per day. From May 25, 2018, the new law applies. But your client does not need a data privacy until May 25. He needs one as long as he processes the personal data of these persons from the EU. So that's the second opportunity for the firm, a lifelong uh, relationship. Well, you can imagine that several clients of mine stopped with doing business in the EU because of this. The new law is an expensive law. Compliance with the new GDPR will require additional investment. The law firm Baker and McKenzie reports that 70% of the respondents believe that organizations will need to invest additional budget or effort to comply with the consent data mapping and cross-border data transfer requirements under the GDPR. So a very important question of, of, of course we should ask ourselves is, what are personal data? Well, let me start with examples. A lot of people think that personal data are data about race or health, politics, trade union memberships, biometric data like eye scans, sexual orientation, religious or political belief. Well, those data, data are sensitive data, special categories of personal data. The definition of personal data is any information relating to an identified or identifiable individual. So we're talking about a name, an address, a postal code, an occupation, a fingerprint, a phone number, an email address, not a general email address like info, but any other email address, an IP number, a credit card number, a birthday, a photo, Facebook posts, a license plate, a drop of blood, a voice recording, gender, events registration information, recruitment information, nationality, job function, internet pages visited, areas of scientific interest, uh, interest information on a SIM card. So anything that discloses your identity that is unique to you as a person. Any information relating to an identified or an identifiable individual. And the combination of innocent data could also lead to an identified or an identifiable individual. Um, so think about, by example, all the apps in the UIE that use email addresses. They all need a data privacy officer. The law also addresses the export of personal data outside Europe. The data relates to someone and thus can have an influence on the privacy rights of this person. By example, if we would have a list of first names of 600 people, to research which names are the most <coughs> popular in the UAE at the moment, the list does not contain personal data. But if we would add occupations and income data and Google Maps data to research a bit more, all of us feel that this list gets more dangerous. All kind of online identifiers can leave traces which, when combined with unique identifiers or other information received by service, can be used to create profiles of data subjects and identify them. So this is including cookies and IP addresses. So the new law consists of two parts, the regulation for companies and the directive for governments and governmental bodies. Well, an another nice thing to mention, or nice, as soon as a person is deceased, the GDPR is no longer applicable. But as soon as any person alive is involved, by example, a widow of the deceased on the same address, the GDPR is applicable again. So I already mentioned that personal data can no longer be transferred to countries outside the European economic area, unless these countries guarantee the same level of data protection. The UAE, by example, doesn't guarantee the same level of data protection, according to the European Commission. Well, then we have 
another thing that uh, I'm almost at the end of my uh, speech that I would like to mention, that is the difference between the controller versus the processor. The new law shows us two types of responsibilities regarding the protection of personal data, data controllers and data processors. A processor is a company that acts on behalf of a controller. So all of us give our information to a bank, the controller, and the bank hires a company to store our information, the processor. According to the new law, it is important to have control over the data you store. And both parties, so the controller and the pro uh, processor, are responsible. Fines can be imposed to both parties. Another nice opportunity for us law firms, all these parties new new contracts, contract checks, etc. And then there's another nice opportunity, the codes of conduct. Under the GDPR, the use of codes of, codes of conduct is encouraged to serve as a tool to demonstrate compliance with the new law. And for all uh, the litigation lawyers, you already mentioned something about it. The new rights of portability of data and the right to be forgotten will encourage disgruntled ex-employees, consumers, members of the media, etc., to file complaints about data controllers to the regulator. Profiling, by example, is one of the areas that probably will lead to an increase in litigation. Profiling means any form of automated processing of personal data consisting of using those data to evaluate certain personal aspects relating to a natural person. In particular, to analyze or predict the aspects concerning the natural person's performance at work, his economic situation, health, personal preferences, reliability, location, movements. Non-compliance can result in legal action or large fines, up to 4% of an organization's global turnover or uh, 80 million uh, dirhams. Also, think about the potential for large US-style class action claims where data security breaches affect a large number of individuals. But companies, of course, are not only worried about the large fines. What worries them most are negative media or social coverage of compliance failure. These costs can sometimes be even higher than this 4% of the global turnover or 80 million dirhams if newspapers write a big story about a data breach. And don't forget, by example, hospitals, they have at least one data breach per hospital per day. In case of such breach, the controller shell within 27 hours, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 72 hours after having become aware of it, notify the authorities. And then this organization needs, the, the, I already mentioned it before, the data protection officer because the controller has to communicate the name and the contact details of this data protection officer to the authorities. So the way that I look at it is, well, there are a lot of new opportunities <coughs> coming our way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lady Hilda. Now let's proceed to the next speaker, is Ghazan Haddad, Senior Legal Counsel of Choweri Group, a media practitioner, lawyer, and legal consultant, and mediator. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me in World Litigation Forum. So uh, for the people who doesn't know who is Choweri Group, Choweri Group is the leading media representation company in the region. What do we do? We represent TV stations, radio, um, online publishers, outdoor advertising, and then we sell their ad space and air times to, to advertisers and to media agencies. I'll tackle during my presentation another aspect of um, the cybersecurity, privacy, and data, uh, data protection related to my field of work. I'll talk about the importance of social media and advertising nowadays and how the laws in the region, as well as the laws such as GDPR, are applied to websites that are established in the region. But before all that, let's analyze a regular day we live in. You wake up on a ringtone or an alarm based on a music that you like and that you set the, the previous day. You talk to your Alexa or to your Google Home, and then you ask them what's the best way and how traffic will be from your, from your place of um, residence to your work. Then you enter YouTube, 
say you, you look on a documentary about <coughs> India and then uh, you research 10 best things to do for Rajasthan because you're planning to do something, um, I mean, the next uh, trim trimester of the year. You spend an average of 30 seconds on the documentary, another 20 seconds on the article, and then you're off to work. In the setup of data collection, analysis, extraction, and use of today, you are now subject to what we call behavioral advertising, such as booking.com, prices in Rajasthan is go are going down. Book before it's too late on your next email, on the, on the next website you visit, on maybe in the next trade you, you will listen to. But in the near future, and it's happening nowadays in some states in the US, on your way to work, you would be hearing your favorite music that you set up on the alarm, this is the previous day, on the background of an advertisement that it broadcasted solely on your car radio, not on the next car radio. You would be seeing outdoors advertising that are targeted to you, given that we know which roads are you taking and what time you pass by this particular road. You'll be walking in the neighborhood and receiving text messages um, using particular technologies such as Beacon on what is near you depending on your behavior, mood, interaction for this specific day with others. Tailored offer will be presenting to you during the day, tailored information leaflets arriving to your desk, tailored for phone calls, etc. In a nutshell, in the content and advertising field of today, you are and will be controlled. I've been reading lately a book for Thomas Friedman and uh, entitled Thank You for Being Late. For the people who did not read the book yet, I really recommend to read it. It tackles how technologies affected us in the past, they're affecting us now, and will affect us in the future. Friedman tackle greatly the topic of advertisement by explaining how sensing that softwares are transforming retails. What a lot of people may not realize, in order for a phone to make a connection on the internet, it's constantly sending out a unique number that is embedded in that phone, what we call the MAC address, to say, hey, any Wi-Fi out there? And by using this content probe requested by the phone looking for Wi-Fis, you could actually track where that phone has been, how often that phone comes there, down to a few feet. Retailers now use this information to set what displays you lingered over their stores and which ones tempted you to make a purchase, leading them to adjust displays even within the same day. But that's not half of it. Big data now allows retailers to, to track who drove by which billboard and then shopped in one of their stores. For instance, the US largest billboard company, Clear Channel Outdoor, is bringing customized pop-up ads to the interstate. Its radar system, up and running in Boston and 10 other US cities, use um, tele, uh, at and which is a mobile provider, uh, service provider, collected on 130 million subscribers uh, and two other companies, Places IQ and Places Inc., which used phone apps to track the coming and going of millions more. So Clear Channel knows what kind of people are driving past one of their billboards at 6.30 p.m. on a Friday, how many for, say, their Dunkin' Donuts regulars, and how many have been to H&M so far this year. And it can then precisely target ads to them. Hence, guessing is officially over. So might be privacy. When you think of all the data that's being vacuumed, by giant firms such as Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, IBM, Netflix, Cisco, all the telephone companies, how efficiently they can now mine that data for insight, you have to wonder how anyone will be able to compete with them. No one else will have that much data exhaust as raw material to analyze and fuel better and better prediction. Data exhaust is now power. So according to Kay Fuli, uh, president of Innovation Artificial Intelligence Institute, the more data you have, the, the better your product. The better your product, the, the more data you can collect. The more data you can collect, the more talent you can attract, and the more talent you can attract, the better your product. So it's a virtuous circle. Now that we have talked a little bit, I mean, about the importance of data, what's its link to cybersecurity, and what are the laws in place in the region? Um, we tend to, you, to, to discuss right of privacy in a very relative, um, I mean, in a very generic way, without even discussing the laws that are applicable on the right to access an internet and, and the laws that, that deals with restriction of content on the internet. Once the access is granted and the restriction on the content are abided by according to the laws in place, then we will be entitled to talk about right of privacy and data collection. Hence, my intervention will be divided on three parts. First, I'll briefly discuss the importance of internet and social media platforms in the region and the laws in place. Afterwards, I'll discuss the restrictions on the internet and social media, notably restrictions that are linked both to access and to content. And then I'll, I'll, I'll end up by discussing the right of privacy and data protection um, from an advertising point of view. So in the MENA region, we spend an average, according to studies, 
uh, of more than 11 hours on, digit on, on media, and 41% of that uh, time is spent on digital media. Time, time spent with traditional media such as books and newspapers and magazines is showing a decrease, and newspapers in the regions are having a hard time keeping up with the challenges of securing revenues. Number of Lebanese and UAE renowned newspapers either shut down or became purely digital. We witness this in our industry as the companies and the advertisers we deal with on a regular basis, they're shifting that advertising budget from traditional media to digital media. Now what are the laws that govern digital media in the region? In the UAE we have a set of laws, no, uh, notably the law on printed materials and publications of 1980. It was designed more with the traditional print media industry but uh, given the wording uh, which is wide enough, it covers now digital media as well. We have the national standards issued by the National Media Council that states some content restriction as the ones provided for in the media law. You have the TRA, which is the Telecommunication Regulatory Authority, that issues internet guidelines related to the content on the internet. These guidelines must be taken into consideration to ensure the security of the internet and to protect end users from harmful websites containing materials that are contrary to religious and ethical values of the UAE. In addition to that, we have the most important um, um, law, which is the cybercrime law. It contains content restrictions similar to the media law. We have the discrimination law, which talks about defamation and the offense on religion. We have the penal code, which contains restrictions such as disclosure of private information, etc. It's worth mentioning that according to the cybercrime law, whoever uh, is condemned on, in any of its crimes can be deported. So the court can issue a deportation. And um, nowadays, I mean, they're issuing the deportation as more or less automatic with any fine that it would be ruled under the cybercrime law. Um, who monitors? So who monitors the content on the internet? We have the UAE Telecommunication Regulatory Authority, which, on, which monitors online content available and prohibits content for hacking and malicious codes, internet content providing unlicensed voice over IP, and other illegal internet content. In addition to that, we have the licensed mobile telecommunication uh, service providers, which are due under the Salat. They can also block content if required. And subsequent of, to complaints of abuse or defamation, authorities can take legal action against those running the sites. Now that we have talked about the laws, we will be tackling what the law considers as cybercrime in terms of restriction to access and restriction to content. With respect to restriction of access, the past year has been a myriad of issues across the region with social networks being closed or blocked. For instance, in Morocco and the UAE, all the telecom operators block access to services which allow users to make free calls through an internet connection, such as Skype, Viber, Tango, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, to name a few. The National Authority justified the decision that none of the services providing a voice over IP had the required license. UAE also issued a provision banning the use of VPN, a tool that's usually used by expats to stream either TV or to use voice over IP. Turkey blocked access to social networks at various points of over the year, July after the reported coup attempt, in November after the arrest of uh, some politicians, etc. So in, but let's return back to the UAE. According to the law, whoever is caught gaining access to a website, network, or system without authorization is to be imprisoned and fined at least 300,000 dirham, but fines can go as high as 1 million dirham if personal information is stolen or deleted. For the VPN use, Act Article 1 of Federal Law of 2016, number 12 of 2016, provides for a punishment of temporary imprisonment and a fine of not less than 500,000 dirham and not more than 2 million dirham for whoever uses a fraudulent computer network protocol address by using a false address or a third party address or by any other mean, but it limited for the purpose of committing a crime or preventing its discovery. Now the interpretation of a crime or preventing its discovery is up to the court to decide which is considered a crime or not, and then they will, public, they will punish whoever is caught accessing a VPN uh, accordingly. As for the restriction to content, if we look at the region, in May a Turkish court convicted a former Miss Turkey for insulting President Erdogan online. She received a 14-month suspended prison sentence for sharing a satirical poem on her Instagram account in 2014, as well as a Gulf national was sentenced to three years in prison and fined 60,000 dirham, then deported after his serving his uh, jail term, after ridiculing Emirati martyrs in Yemen and describing them as cowards on WhatsApp. You have to know that according to the laws in place in the UAE, the content restrictions including the, include the following. Criticizing the rulers of the Emirates of the UAE. 
instigation against Islam or harm to the state interests or, so or, so or so society values, opinions violate violating public discipline, insulting children, or circulating subversive ideas, inciting criminal activity, hatred, or dissension, publishing confidential official or military communication, publishing in bad faith or misinterpreting minutes of meetings, deliberations, or court hearings, blemishing the president of an Arab, Islamic, or any other friendly state, or causing agitation to relations between the UAE and such states, defaming Arabs, their civilizations and heritage, and reporting news on ongoing criminal investigations if the judge orders investigations to be kept confidential. In addition to all the above, according to the Communication Regulatory Authority, one should not post vulgar photos or of alcohol. Non-Muslim can drink in the country, but keep it under control if pictures are inappropriate. Drunken photos that offend Islamic values or morals of the UAE can lead to legal trouble. One should not obviously post pornographic or material that contains nudity. One should not bully or harass. User must not, must not post content which includes hate speech, incite violence, or which is threatening or contains graphic or gratuitous violence. In the advertising field, one should not publish ads, for instance, that are related to, uh, to contraceptive pills or condoms, to tobacco or to drugs. These are both considered as contrary to Islamic values or to the laws in place. One, both restrictions of content and access have been abided by, each internet user has the right of privacy. And we can talk about the data protection, which is the final part of my intervention. So with respect to pri right, pri right of privacy, the new cybercrime law expands the definition of conduct violating the privacy of others by criminalizing eavesdropping, transmitting and disclosing communication, including audio and visual material, taking photographs of others, copying, saving, publishing them, publishing news, comment, statements, and information, even if they are authentic. In particular, who is caught using technology to invade someone else's privacy, can be jailed for six months and face fines between 150,000 dirham, reaching 500,000, and in some cases, one, one million or two million dirhams. Here are some rules to keep in mind. When you post a photo, uh, when you post a photo, uh, a photo care, care needs to be taken including via social media, since the cybercrime law makes it an offense to use any IT mean to, bre to breach someone else's privacy. One example amongst many is a group of friends sharing a picture of their girlfriend on WhatsApp without her consent. She submitted a lawsuit against the entire group, and the court considered that, in addition to the persons that shared the photo, even the person who just saved the photo on his phone without the victim consent should be punished. Disclosing secrets relating to someone's private life without that person's consent can attract liability. Similarly, disclosure of confidential information, such as information belonging to an employer, can also attract liability. Lately, a woman was fined and ordered to be deported from the United Arab Emirates for breaching her husband's privacy by checking his cell phone to see if, was, if he was cheating on her. She was fined 150,000 dirham by the criminal court in the Emirates of Ajman. She admitted she had accessed his phone without his permission and transferred photos to her device. The husband lodged a complaint with the court, which convicted her under the cybercrime law, which penalized the invasion of privacy of another person using information technology. Irrespective if she discovered or not that her husband is cheating on her, she's deported. The penal code makes it an offense to publish information that exposes another person to public hatred or content, or to make a false accusation which dishonors or discredit another person. Um, the regulator warns the internet users not to make threats by making comments that are abusive or threatening to other po uh, people. One example amongst others is the case of an Indian employee that has left the UAE a day after he was dismissed from a Dubai company following his online private messaging abuse against an Indian journalist based in India. The journalist exposed the private message on Twitter and her followers did the, did the investigation and traced the employee location and sent warnings to the company. His company responded that he's not respecting the laws and regulations in the UAE and dismissed him upon his request before serious action take place against him. Now what's interesting is that the interpretation of defamation include accurate information as long as the statement or publication cause harm to the complainant. In this context, a UAE official was filmed in the midst of a physical altercation with a motorist following a minor traffic incident. The filmmaker was arrested, and the official's family initially filed a case against him for what was reported to be a defamation. So truth is not a defense to a defamation claim in the UAE. The other case was the case of an Australian woman who was fined and deported in Abu Dhabi for a cybercrime offense after she posted a picture of a car parked across two disabled parking spaces outside her apartment. 
So the right way to do it is to go to the police and declare um, the crime or the the whatever is wrong with the situation and not to publish it online. The cybercrime law also expands the categories of private information and punish any person who any person who unlawfully access credit card numbers, electronic card numbers, banking account statements, details of electronic payment methods by imprisonment and or a fine. I'll end where um, um, Hilda talked about the GDPR and its applicability to um, companies um, established in the region. Um, so in addition to the fact that even if a company, I would say, it is incorporated just in the UAE but has a PO box in, in the EU or an agent or a, bank an account, or a bank account, it falls automatically under the GDPR. And um, organizations that are solely incorporated here without any link, if they offer goods or service to individuals in the EU, they, are, they would follow. Or if they're engaging, such as, say, our online publishers or advertisers in monitoring or profiling activities of individuals in the EU, for example, using cookies or behavioral advertising, as we saw in the beginning, they would be subject to the GDPR. If we take an example of a publisher website who use first-party cookies, what's a first-party cookies? It's a cookie that you um, put on your website to track down which user uh, visit this website, what's the profile of the user, what's the interest of the user, how many times he spent on the website, which articles he read. So if you have this first part cookie, or you have the third party cookie, which is the cookies that an advertiser put on the website on behalf of the publisher in order to see what kind of users are visiting this particular website and to put advertising on, on the website itself. There's a gray area if these websites should fall under the GDPR or should not fall under the PGDR. One, one, I mean, one argument would be that they should fall as long as residents of the EU are visiting these websites. So some publishers chose, in order not to be in compliant and to um, bear, I mean, expenses to be GDPR compliant, to close the websites for EU because they're not interested to have EU visitors. They're really targeting the, the region and they want to remain targeting the region. Another, um, I mean, another element would be considered is if these websites have European-led content or use the euro currencies. In these cases, they would be most probably subject to the GDPR as well. Um, a final example I would give, and you give it, I, you gave it, I guess, briefly, is the, the example of a European user who passed by the UAE, who download an application, any mobile application here, and then goes to his home country and continue to use this application. Theoretically, he'll be protected by the GDPR and the company that did not even, I mean, had a say in him downloading the mobile app or not downloading the mobile app will, be, will have to be in compliance with the GDPR when collecting his information. So just to conclude, I mean, irrespective of, there, there's a high risk that each website or each mobile application would be subject. So, I mean, my company had taken the decision of being GDPR compliant. We have a data team in place that we're going to have a data protection officer. So if you have a small risk, I mean, the cost of being compliant is much less than the fines that would be if you're not compliant with the GDPR. So thank you for listening. And I guess there's a little bit of time before eating, right? <laughs> there's a lot of time to discuss. OK. Yes, you have a question there. Thanks a lot for this inspiring information. Lots of um, useful stuff uh, there. Uh, my question to uh, Lady Hilda. Uh, thanks for your uh, amazing presentation. Uh, I have a few questions um, relating to um, implementation of the um, uh, GDPR on uh, how, how will the implementation be monitored? Is this something that is monitored actively or only if someone raises a claim for breach of data privacy? This is one question. The second question, uh, how can this uh, regulation be enforced if the company does not have legal presence in EU so how would be the enforcement mechanism if the company does not have uh, an EU, uh, EU presence, legal presence. And last comment just for a confirmation. Um, uh, my understanding is that if the data subject gives their consent for the process of their, uh, their data, then this 
would make the company in compliance. Uh, so this is one way of mitigating the risk is to make sure that all data subjects within a company, for example, give the written consent. Um, it's a little bit tricky when it comes, for example, to the example of the uh, the application, uh, for example, would be w if there is a provision within the T's and C's while you you download this app, would that be considered a um, written consent? Or will this not qualify as a consent if there is a provision within the T's and C's of the app that gives the permission that if you are a data subject under blah, blah, then you give the consent. Would that be qualified as a, as a, as a valid consent? Or given that you have to agree, <laughs> uh, it's not going to be um, uh, considered as a valid one. And on a, on a separate note, I'm interested to know what happens with the wife and husband. Did he manage to marry another wife? Or <laughs> if you know, let us know the update. If that's not a breach of, <laughs> of that, <laughs> that's quite an interesting case. Thank you. OK, well, I'll start with uh, your question about the consent. Uh, if it's enough if uh, this uh, person says, I agree. Well, the new law uh, also states that uh, if I have a company and I want my client to checkbox, I agree, that I have to be very clear to what's my client, what exactly I am doing with their data. And I also, I'm not allowed to use too much legal words. So it has to be, the client has to, a, a normal person without any legal background has to be able to understand what uh, this company will do with his information. How long will they store it, by example, for what kind of purposes? Uh, also, of course, you have the right to be uh, forgotten, uh, which is one of the, well, we already know that right, but now uh, it is expressed more uh, uh, in the law. So at every time when, by example, if I am that natural person, every time when I want it, I have to be able to say, well, at this moment, I do, uh, do not give, uh, I, I don't give any, uh, I'm sorry, I don't give my permission anymore. And by example, uh, for children, there are special regulations. So a child under 13, by example, uh, so if this company, uh, by example, uh, uses apps for school activities or something like that, the parents, that is back to the agree uh, part of your question, the parents have to give their formal consent. And also you have to make sure that the parents at every time can say, we don't, at this moment, we don't give our permission any longer. So it's not only about I agree, but it is for more, you, it has to be very understandable for everyone, not just for a lawyer. And you can't, it's not enough anymore to just state on a website, oh, uh, these are our general terms and conditions and this is our privacy regulation and uh, if you checkbox this, everything is okay. That is no longer sufficient uh, at this moment. Uh, well, another question you asked, um, uh, if this compliance is actively monitored by the authorities, uh, at this moment, with the current law, that is not the case. So, um, uh, at the moment that a certain person raises a question or a complaint, uh, they start with acting. And then, uh, also you asked about uh, the enforcement mechanism. Uh, well, there is this European Privacy Authority that um, it is not completely clear at this moment. In order to prepare for today's meeting, I tried to find how exactly they will do that, by example, in the, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, but that's not completely clear at the moment because it's a very new law. Um, but they certainly uh, will do that. But after a complaint, so it's, it's not that, that the authorities are monitoring every company 
uh, in the country by example to see if they comply uh, to the new law. Uh, thank you. I have just one uh, quick question to uh, Ghassan. Um, is there any way where I am as a user of internet can uh, uh, stop uh, this type of advertisement that is chasing you and feel like you are actually watched? Like, uh, so this is actually very annoying from a personal perspective. And I, I, was, I always wonder, how do they know? And now I understand how do they know I'm searching for specific things. And uh, I'm wondering if there is a way that I can stop that. Yeah, so to answer your question with websites usually, so the thing is, it's not monitored, but the websites that are following, uh, f following the international guidelines of um, advertising or of uh, putting cookies on the website, what you see on the first time you use a website to enhance, they call it to enhance user experience. Please accept, I mean, that we, we, we will put cookies or, I mean, we will track. So you have the option to opt out and believe me, the user experience will be the same. I mean, unless you really want targeted, I mean, based on the content you, you saw and then to say, hey, again, yes, mean, welcome back to the website and, and these, these things or to show up in the first, the, um, the home page of the website, the contents that you previously wo um, watched or, or read. Um, so you can opt out. You have, you should have like a possibility of opting out from, from the tracking um, first party and third party cookies when you first visit the website. But then, uh, as well an advice, whenever you visit a website, go to your internet browser, clear cookies from the last time I visited. Every time do this. Okay, so, so, so I can do it, uh, not necessarily on the first visit, I can do it anytime. Yes. Okay. I mean, to, to, to clear up the cookies, yes, and then they will ask you again. So they will not have a tracking anymore, so okay. they would ask you again. Thank you. Just to add on, I think the you know, same thing goes with the apps as well. I mean, in fact, I've kind of experienced, you know, I mean, you know, when I did, uh, you know, some search on Dubai and all, I mean, even till now, I mean, you know, I did it for purpose. I mean, I, I keep getting, you know, the pop-ups from booking.com and all giving me options and all. I think clearly, you know, the, I think we had to not only delete the, uh, you know, cookies, but also the history. And also, uh, even when you do a Google search as well, I mean, uh, the search keywords uh, remain. So I think even we have to go and, you know, remove that kind of history. I think little bit of maintenance, I see. And sometimes in some of the apps, I mean, they ask you about, okay, should I access the location? And, you know, though it is not necessary. So I think we have to be really careful in terms of what we are, you know, accepting and, you know, based on the service. Yeah. Just one more tip as well. Um, so where you're in a mall or a restaurant or anywhere, don't, don't connect to the Wi-Fi as well of the place because they will track where you are, how long did you spend, and even they can track down to the invoice. I mean, they can go really far with what you ordered and then so, and they can collect all the information and use it for advertising. Thank you very much for the presentations. I'd like to ask about GDPR's approach to smart contracts, the blockchain method, because uh, with the smart contracts, we know that we can even transact about uh, buying a car or renting a house, so on and so forth. And we have to provide a certain uh, extent of personal information. And uh, since there is no central registration, and since there is no central uh, government or administration of smart contracts, uh, there is no way to opt out. And if we want to use it as an evidence in case of dispute, the strength of evidence of smart contracts comes from the fact that they can be trackable by anybody in the system, whoever is registered in that particular blockchain. So uh, if we cannot opt out from this after we gave so much personal information, and since it's a self-disclosed personal information, how will GDPR and the regulatory authorities will, will ever tackle if the people will claim that their personal information is undermined uh, in other uh, platforms. So if you are aware of any approach, I would be very happy to hear about it. Thank you. Well, in that case, so I imagine that uh, you are the person, um, for some reason, you didn't provide your personal information. Somebody else stole your information, by example, and there's suddenly this uh, contract. Um, then uh, the so then you will file a complaint against a certain 
uh, party because you, uh, at a certain moment, you found out who is using uh, your information. And then that organization would have to prove that they did all the necessary uh, and took all the necessary precautions uh, to make sure that this can't happen. And the rest of it, you know, also with the blockchain uh, technology uh, in the Netherlands, I worked for uh, the, the notarial organization. So all the notaries in the Netherlands are organized. And of course, also because they thought, well, there's a lot of uh, money going from our offices to this circle that we don't know yet. Uh, they are also taking precautions and they are stating that somehow a notary or an, any other lawyer should be somewhere in the blockchain uh, technology. But that is all, you know, for us lawyers, we could make money on this for years because a lot of it still has to be developed and it's not as black and white uh, at this moment. That is what I can say about that question. Any further questions? Uh, Lady Hilda, I just have a quick one for you. Let's say an Asian company hires a, uh, an EU citizen, be an expat. Is the local company bound by the GDPR? Yes. Really? Yeah, um, oh, well, not if they have only one yeah. employee from the EU. Uh, but as long as, as you know, they have uh, several ones of them and they keep their organization, uh, their, the information about their employees somewhere. And, you know, it's not even about digital data. The GDPR is also a, a data breach. It's also, by example, if I have a very important stick with information and I leave it on the back seat uh, of a taxi, by example. So, uh, or if I have just a hard copy of a letter and there's confidential information, there's privacy information in this letter and, you know, I have to bring it to someone and I lose it, that's also considered a data breach. But to answer your question, indeed, if this company hires a person from the EU, and they keep data, somewhere the GDPR could be okay. applicable. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's just about this 5,000 data uh, subject. So if, if it would be a very small company with only one employee, uh, it wouldn't be applicable. No, you, oh, how about a situation where it's a big Asian company and because there are EU citizens who are experts in particular fields, they employ them so that they could share information. Would they be covered? Would the Asian country, uh, company be covered? Let's say two or three expats. No, because then uh, they wouldn't ha there wouldn't be 5,000 data subjects, so 5,000 natural persons. Thank you. So for the very small uh, companies, and, and you know, this 5,000 people, there's still, you know, the law, there are several, at this moment, several organizations talking about the new law, and it isn't even that clear yet. So maybe you want to yeah. add no, something. Um, I mean, as far as I, I know that um, you, you shouldn't look at the nationality, but rather if the, the person is resident in the EU or not. So one way of, it's not about hiring a European, it's more about hiring a European who's resident in the EU and still resident in the EU, in order to see if it's... Yeah, the law mentions in, in the EU. Uh, oh, yeah. but still, you know, in several places in the law, there are differences, so yeah. the law isn't very clear about it. So there's a school of thought that says, for as long as he's a resident, yeah. or it's possible also that he is a citizen. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you very much for the great presentation. Thank you, Tranko, and all the speakers for their very informative 
presentation. Now I would request Tranquil to present the mementos to the speakers. Thank you. 